All right. This chapter takes us through the three Islamic empires. Sometimes they are called the gunpowder empires. Your textbook points out that the Ottomans, the Safavids, uh, the Mughals all were really good at using gunpowder, which had already been invented, brought over from China. The uh, All three would be very good at it. So this is uh, a, it's kind of a transition area. If you look at Europe here on this map, you can see the Ottoman Empire here in green. The uh, What's going to become the Safavid Empire is uh, out here in the east, out here. And so uh, you have kind of this transition area. The Ottoman Empire is really two, an empire that's in two distinct worlds. One is the Islamic world. Uh, it's been a center of trade for a long time. Uh, it controls the holy cities. Uh, it has control of Jerusalem, for example. And But it's also, if you guys notice later on in the 1500s, pushing up here into Europe. So it's sort of on this borderland between the European world and the Islamic world. The Ottoman Empire will be by far the most successful. And uh, it's the one that your textbook tar starts off talking about. The, the text goes through and talks about the, uh, the major, uh, I guess, developments in uh, the Ottoman Empire, whether it's the foundation under uh, Osman Bey or uh, the Osman I, the uh, expansion, uh, and then, of course, the, the flowering of the Ottoman Empire later on when it gets into the art, the culture. The important thing to remember about the Ottoman Empire is uh, that it's going to expand, uh, but it's also going to be blocked. It's not going to be able to expand up here into Europe any further because of the Austrian Empire. And it's also not going to be able to expand out here because of the Safavids. And this border between the Safavid Empire and the Ottoman Empire is one that's always in flux. The Ottoman Empire, though, uh, develops here, spreads, takes control of what used to be Constantinople, then becomes Istanbul, which becomes the capital. And uh, the Ottoman Empire will flower and develop until you get into, uh, really, the, the 1700s. Then it's kind of, kind of begins this kind of slow decline. And you'll see that later on when we uh, get into World War I, uh, that the, uh, the Ottoman Empire is referred to as the sick man of Europe. It's kind of a dying empire by the time we get to World War I. But it does hold on until... Uh, the, uh, the early 1900s. So it lasts several hundred years here in uh, the, the Mediterranean world. The, uh, you can go through and read the, the text. It, the Ottoman Empire is not all that complicated. Uh, all right, you'll see some uh, very important things. The, uh, you can talk about the expansion of the Ottoman Empire you can talk about the conquest, for example, under Mehmet of uh, Istanbul, or what, or what used to be Constantinople, which becomes Istanbul, and how uh, that really becomes the, the capital of the Ottoman world. Uh, the, uh, the Ottoman Empire reaches its height under Suleiman the Magnificent. You'll see a lot of the art, the culture, flower during the reign of Suleiman. Uh, the, uh, and you see some of that most important thing is to remember that the Ottoman bureaucracy revolves around the Sultan. The Sultan controls everything. He is the supreme, almost, you might as well think of him as an absolute monarch, an absolute king. And then he rules the various regions uh, through local administrators and through the military. So uh, the military for the Ottoman Empire, very important. It's what allowed them to expand and it's what allowed them to control a lot of the empire. Most of that military was, and a lot of that military was made up of people who were uh, really conquered and technically really are slaves. The textbook talks about the Ottoman use of slaves. Probably the most famous are the Janissaries. Uh, some, the, the, uh, the Ottoman word is Janissari, but it kind of translates and becomes anglicized into Janissaries. And essentially they were children young people who were captured, especially in Southeastern Europe and others brought back to the Ottoman Empire, converted to Islam, uh, and uh, given weapons. Here you can see the Janissaries carrying firearms into battle. And they were 
a an integral and very important and very high ranking part of uh, the military. So uh, you will see how important really uh, the the expansion of uh, the Ottoman Empire, how this brings in new people, how they are converted and become uh, part of the empire. The uh, the next sort of segment talks about the Safavids, which is if you look at the map here, kind of stuck in the middle. The Ottomans are over here, the Mughals are over here, we're going to talk about them in a minute, and the Safavids are really stuck here in the middle in uh, what is today modern-day Iran. This is the ancient capital of what used to be the Persian Empire. The uh, the type of Islam here is is different. The uh, While the Ottoman Empire is Sunni, the Safavids are uh, a uh, branch of Islam called Shia, or they're called Shiites. And it's a little bit different. Make sure you read about the differences between uh, the the Shia faith of Islam and uh, the kind of the Orthodox or the Sunni part. The uh, you guys can see that the Safavids uh, will reach their height under Shah Abbas. Shah is just another word for king. It's the Persian word for king. And uh, while the Ottomans referred to their leaders as sultans. Uh, the Safavids return or refer to theirs as Shahs. So they will expand and take control of these areas. And essentially, this is the border of what is the Mughal Empire. It's the Indus River right there, which used to be the traditional border of uh, India. Now, of course, the Indus River is in uh, the, the modern day country of Pakistan. But the, uh, the Safavids here are kind of stuck in the middle on uh, really some important trade routes. It's Fahan right here becomes the capital and uh, it is a major uh, trading route carrying goods from over here into the Mediterranean world. Rugs, uh, uh, mosaic tiles, uh, craftsmen, very important in the Safavids. Then the book kind of takes us to India and you talk about the Mughals and you'll read about Babur who brings uh, Islam into India. The uh, when the Mughals first arrived, they aren't big fans of uh, the, uh, the caste system in India, of uh, some of the things that were part of Hinduism in India. But they will eventually take control of, if you look at the map here, take control of northern India, all right, spread into these areas, and uh, they will take Delhi by 1526 or so. But the uh, Really, the empire reaches its height under Akbar. Akbar is very tolerant. Akbar will uh, try to uh, allow religious toleration. He's very tolerant of Hindus, actually allows Hindus into the administration. He's trying to blend together the two uh, groups. His successors, though, uh, the, the last Mughal kings, they don't really do a very good job of this at all. And it will eventually lead to... Uh, their collapse. So those are the three uh, empires that you will be exposed to as you read uh, this chapter. And it's kind of important to understand the difference between all of them. Okay? Uh, there's Babur, and uh, you can see the, the extent of Mughal territory by about 1605, which is mostly northern India. There's Akbar's palace, all right, Fatipur Sikri, and uh, then the book kind of takes you into a lot of the arts from uh, the various areas. So you'll get to see everything from rug making, uh, Turkish rug making here, a, an Ottoman rug. They'll take you into uh, the buildings and the palaces. Uh, so uh, you'll get to see things like the Blue Mosque. You'll, I think the book even talks a little bit about how the, the Hagia Sophia becomes uh, a mosque, here's the blue mosque in the interior. So a lot of artisans, a lot of craftsmen, a lot of uh, art, whether it be illuminating pages of the Quran, here's artists, a lot of artists' interpretations uh, of uh, the various things uh, that are illustrated in the Quran, the text from the Quran. You can uh, go on and see, if you move into Mughal India, you get to see the Taj Mahal. Now remember, this is in India, but it has some of the same characteristics. You can see the minarets here, so uh, you can uh, 
talk about the, uh, or you can see that Islamic influence in uh, the Indian architecture of that time. The, uh, you uh, can go to Isfahan and see uh, the, uh, the, the architecture there. And again, you can see some of uh, the Islamic influences there. The, uh, the other thing, you'll see the book talk about gardening and landscape. That's a big part of it as well. The Taj Mahal, I'm going to go back to that. The, uh, a lot of people that, that are uh, connected to the Taj Mahal. In fact, I saw this great documentary about the Taj Mahal, and uh, the, uh, they pointed out that it wasn't just the, the Taj Mahal. It was the gardens that surrounded it. Supposedly, they were full of very fragrant flowers. And so it wasn't just a visual thing, it was a, 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 a smell thing that it supposedly smelled uh, tremendously uh, beautiful because of all the plants that were around it. The, uh, you can talk about the, uh, as you sort of get into uh, the text, all right, you'll even learn about coffee houses and uh, how coffee houses become important in the Ottoman Empire. So uh, the book kind of takes you through each of these empires and then into uh, the the culture of each one of them. Okay, and then uh, it will finish up talking a little bit about how uh, people who weren't Muslim had to uh, adjust to being ruled by Muslims in these areas. Whether it was the Ottomans, whether it was the Safavids, whether it was the Mughals, there were non-Islamic groups in every one of those. They were taxed. They uh, weren't always converted. The uh, in a lot of places, Christians could remain Christians or Jews could remain Jews as long as they paid uh, the the tax. So uh, there, uh, and some of them were very willing to pay the tax because of uh, how important trade was uh, in moving through those areas. The uh, and of course the book sort of finishes out talking about how important the trade was. One of the things that you'll see at the end uh, is uh, the beginnings of European involvement in these areas, whether it's the Portuguese arrival uh, to uh, India in uh, the, the late 1400s, the Dutch arrival later on, and then eventually the British arriving. And uh, eventually you guys are going to find out that British are going to take control uh, of India. But in the beginning, you see a lot of uh, really the... European involvement in India in places, especially along the coast. So, uh, and then of course later on, the British are going to move further inland, and they will become a uh, a major player in uh, the uh, in India, especially when the British East India Company arrives. Uh, Britain's going to dominate India, and uh, you will see them in India really for uh, quite some time. All right. So that gives you a little bit of an overview of what you need to be looking for in your reading as uh, you move into uh, these areas. And the, uh, the text kind of finishes up pointing out how each of these uh, goes into political decline. So, and the Europeans are going to eventually become dominant in many of these areas. All right, so uh, that takes care of this chapter, all right? And uh, I'll see you guys again when we talk about the next one.